Welcome to the Cognitive Crucible, produced by the Information Professionals Association. Our website is information-professionals.org, where you can find links and information about today's conversation and get access to members-only content. Join John Bicknell and explore all aspects of our generational challenge, cognitive security. My guest today on the Cognitive Crucible is Dr. Mark Moffat, who is a research biologist at the National Museum of Natural History at the Smithsonian and the author of The Human Swarm, How Our Societies Arise, Thrive, and Fall. Mark Moffat, welcome to the Cognitive Crucible. With great pleasure, John. You have done a tremendous amount of thinking about societies, identity, and belonging. Before we get into these interrelated topics, could you please give our audience a little bit more background about your career? Well, I was one of those uh, dysfunctional children that was out in nature rather than communicating with enough other children. My parents thought this was very concerning, but in fact, I I got to know uh, all kinds of different species and think about how they lived their lives. And so I grew up, obviously, to be a biologist, got into Harvard, remarkably enough, because I wasn't that focused of a student in a general sense, but I did know what I wanted to do. And I became a student of E.O. Wilson. Dr. Wilson is a famous conservationist, but he started off looking at uh, the issue, issues around sociobiology, the social lives of species. And that fascinated me. So I continued traveling. I became a travel expert. If you want to escape town, talk to me, because I find ways of going to places that have very unusual things for me to look for. And over that time, I've been around all kinds of species with complex social organizations and been around various tribal groups and hunter-gatherer groups in different parts of the world. And that led me to thinking about who belongs and who doesn't in a very general sense, a question that usually comes out of psychology I began to think about as a biologist. So that led me to write the, the book you just mentioned. Well, and congratulations, you are the first biologist to be on the Cognitive Crucible, so uh, another Cognitive Crucible first. Whoa! Yes, I know, yes. Uh, Get some more. That's right. Perhaps it might be a useful start point for us to define what is meant by a society. Is there an agreed upon definition? Well, of course, a society, society is a word that gets tossed around a lot. So there's a high society, there's like the National Geographic Society, moving through society, but I'm interested in those things we call nations, the groups that carve the earth up into territories. And uh, there isn't really a neat description of them, but we have in mind what those are in our heads. And those are the groups that we most often pledge allegiance to, fight for, and sometimes even die for. And societies last through the generations, and memberships in them are involuntary. So if you're born into a society, the expectation is that your grandchildren will be part of the society too. And generally, societies have territories. You can argue that uh, some groups like the Romani have lost their territories and still form a kind of a society. And on that basis, animals too have societies. I should say that. And also on that basis, I view societies as focal points of human life throughout history. Yeah, that it really is curious. I mean, society, for me, thinking about it, it's one of those things where it's like you're a fish in a fishbowl. It's just, it just is. It's my life. I've always been in a society, but I guess I've never thought about it deeply as you have. But it is curious how there's this belongingness that spans generations that no one is in charge of. It just kind of happens and seems to be woven into the way we are. Animals, too. Would you say that that's fair? And a number of animals, too. And uh, basically, for us, societies are background noise. We don't think about them all the time. And when things get politically heated, we start to think about them more. So societies have come up more recently than they might have for most of our lives. But things like uh, flags and so forth are things that you don't necessarily notice until and they're all around us, of course, American flags, for example. But when there is a problem in the world, we suddenly gravitate to those things. And that's when they come to the fore. Do you make a significant 
difference between societies and culture? It seems to me that that would be easy to conflate those two things, but I, I suspect that they're also different. Well, originally, uh, as hunter-gatherers, they were pretty much the same thing. Hunter-gatherers lived in small societies of up to a couple thousand individuals spread out in small bands, and they all had basically the same religions and uh, customs of dress and language and so forth. But societies now contain numbers of cultures, so they you can't really connect societies with cultures. They, they have common themes that uh, connect people together within the society, but cultures we're multicultural societies now. Even places like China, where it seems more monolithic, actually has quite a few differences going on in culture. Hmm. Oh, okay, cool. I'd like to put a pin in that thought for just a moment and come back to it in a few minutes and ask you about, uh, I've got a question about sovereignty and concepts of sovereignty during the information age as we have communities forming online. So let's come back to that in just a moment. But first, I wanted to ask you about the interdisciplinary nature of your work. What types of scholars tend to hover around the uh, uh, topic of societies? Well, that was an interesting question because I wrote the book, The, the Human Swarm, with no single objective to push other than to explore how societies work, uh, how they, what they are, and have people reach their own conclusions and because of that, I had to reach out to all kinds of experts, and I ended up with an acknowledgement of, of uh, 500 people. It seems that everybody does something with societies, sociologists, clearly, politics, but then there's anthropology and, of course, history, including archaeology, figuring out mm-hmm. what societies belong to what ruins is a big deal. Biology economics, philosophy, just about everything. Uh, I had to draw from all these different people in gathering this information. Psychology is particularly interesting in terms of how people formulate these identities and where this came from. So oddly enough, sociologists are ambivalent about societies in terms of what I just described. Uh, There's a fellow, Benedict Anderson, famous for doing a book, Imagine Communities, and he thought societies especially nations, came together with the mass media, teaching people to uh, focus down on these large groups. But uh, in fact, societies have always been imagined communities. They were for hunter-gatherers in their little societies too. In their heads, certain people belonged and certain people didn't, and that matched up with those uh, fellow members of their society. So those imagined communities were, in a sense, real and have been throughout time. They're not just a modern thing. Hmm, Yeah. You mentioned economics as well. As a, a whole host of people find this study interesting, obviously. I heard you speak in another forum that societies have a tendency of making people more productive. People gather together in groups and they start divvying up labor and a, a group of people can do more than a single person, et cetera, et cetera. And you start laddering that up to lots and lots of people and you have these distributed networks of uh, complementary efforts on and on and on. Could, could you talk a little bit about how societies help reduce the cognitive load and increase productivity of people? Yeah, no, that's a really interesting question because, uh, in fact, we are quite different now than we used to be as hunter-gatherers. As hunter-gatherers, you knew your culture inside and out. You lived in a small group. You need Every person needed to know how to start a fire, make dinner. There were some differences between the sexes and who hunted and who gathered, but everybody knew their culture. And as societies expanded for reasons we can get into, that became more and more difficult to do. And it put a lot of cognitive load on people to even expect them to know a portion of this. And so with larger societies, we become more specialized. And uh, this was impossible in a small group. If you lose the one person who knows how to make a fire, you're done for. And that apparently, that may well have happened uh, in one culture or another over time. So. The bigger the society, the better the safety net you have because people can specialize. And that becomes an interesting comparison with other species. And 
comparing other species in terms of their strategies is really a valuable thing. I did a, an article called The Misunderstood Art of Making Comparisons for Skeptic Magazine. And uh, mm. I compare ants and humans all the time. And mm -hmm. people find that, oh my gosh, that's uh, Ed, E.O. Wilson, my advisor, got in trouble for that in the 70s. But let me tell you this, comparing two things that are identical is really boring. When science finds things, it's by noticing points of comparison, points of similarity between things that are ordinarily thought of as very different. So I just did an article for the Journal of Organization Design on ants and humans and the business people. This is a leading business journal. It was an invited article. It was called Building Complex Organizations with Minuscule Brains and No Leaders. Mm -hmm. And looking through the different ways ants construct what amount to organizations and comparing them to humans is really instructive. So these uh, kinds of things include the fact that as societies get bigger for ants, they too become more specialized, a small colony of ants. Everybody has to do everything. As societies get bigger and bigger, you get more and more specialists in most cases. And so all these labor dif differences and issues like teamwork and assembly lines emerge in ants as they do in humans with societies growing large. Mm, yeah, that's really interesting, Mark. And that that's something I think that is most definitely of interest to the national security community is, well, a couple things came up. One, uh, your comparison with ants, and I know we'll talk more about animals here, I'm sure in a few moments, but thinking of uh, uh, biomimicry and uh, using animal-related characteristics and trying to infuse that into human bodies and human activities is, is one thing. I'd love to get your comments on that. But two, teams and team forming and leaderless teams. I know that you know Professor Yanir Baryam. He was on the, on the podcast a couple of months ago. We talked briefly about teams, and that's one of his passions is how do we form global teams and have the whole teaming system be cohesive and complementary and leveraging the available energy and creativity that is latent within the human population and turning all of that into a, a beneficial project. I, I'd love to get your comment on both of those items. Uh, well, on the teamwork issue. Yeah. Well, the fortunate thing about humans is that we form societies where we can become friendly with foreigners. Most species can't do that. Ants never do that. Ants, uh, the other colony is always the enemy of your own species, for sure. So humans can take in foreign identities and treat them as potential cooperative people. That doesn't mean they, they, that they become one of us. They retain this foreignness. Uh, they, that never goes away. But the potential of working across societies is something that's rel relatively rare in the animal kingdom. The chimpanzee does not do it. It kills outsiders. And uh, the related bonobo, a species very similar to the uh, chimpanzee, can do it. They, they become friends with the, the neighboring societies. Even though they retain their territories and return to those territories at the end of the day, they all know who belongs, but they, they have friends on the outside. So we are somewhere in between. That's basically the issue for us. We have the warfare aspects of the chimpanzees built into us a little too easily, but also the potential for creating networks and teams across societies. Right. It, it, did you have any thoughts about what I mentioned about biomimicry? Is that something that you've studied much? What you have that biology offers you are many examples of things that have been fine-tuned over millions of years. For example, with ants, it turns out that ants in a very large society are very particular about social hygiene and social health. Chimpanzees do not worry about this. Chimpanzees... Um, you may not, you know, they're, they're throwing their feces around. They're, they're not really into that whole social hygiene thing. But ants in a large society have special sanitation squads and particular ways of dealing with diseases and so forth. They put a lot of their energy into that. And we're finding this as a recent problem for us. So going to the ants and seeing that they've made it a priority in terms of their energy budgets is instructive for us.
We may not use the same techniques, but it certainly tells us how important it is for the success of a society. Mm, right. Yeah, that's interesting. You mentioned this just a moment ago, and I wanted to ask if you could expand on it. But, you know, interestingly, you know, people have developed this capacity to be comfortable in societies around strangers, around people that they don't know. And as I, I believe you just mentioned that this is not to be found with uh, chimpanzees, for example. But could you talk about this curious phenomenon, which is, seems to be really important to human society? Yeah, this is something I came across myself as I started thinking about these things. And, and this includes the realization, the story I usually like to give, the realization that the, the most remarkable thing in the universe is a Starbucks. Have you been in one of those things? Yeah, a couple of times, yeah. <laughs> you know, you can go into those and walk past all these people and get a coffee and nobody wants to kill you or run away in terror. And uh, that's impossible for a chimpanzee. A chimpanzee needs to know and recognize everyone in the room. And uh, this was the subject of an op-ed I wrote for the Wall Street Journal uh, a couple of years ago, The Social Secret That Humans Share With Ants. What we have the chimpanzees don't are all kinds of cues we use, signals that we're taking in very fast. In the blink of the eye, as we pass by people, we're taking in all kinds of characteristics around them and feeling comfortable about, about being with them, this sense of being comfortable in the room. And uh, these add up to kind of a billboard of who we are. And they include obvious things like language, but very subtle things like how we walk and gesture and all these things. And um, this allows us, by being comfortable with the individuals we don't know, it allows us to have what I call anonymous societies, societies that can potentially grow from the hunter-gatherer stage when a couple thousand individuals were there into the millions. This potential was there from the beginning simply because each individual you added wasn't as an additional strain on your brain. You didn't have to keep track of anybody anymore. You still needed to know who your friends were, your networks, but you didn't need to know about everyone in the room. You could be comfortable in that Starbucks. Right, and that back to the, it touches back on the whole cognitive bit about society where these tools have emerged over time, which help people be more productive and without having to expend precious energy on examining and evaluating every single person. Is this friend or foe? Is this person friend or foe? Is this person no. friend or foe? We, yeah, we'd never get anything done if we had to operate like that. In fact, this, uh, the cognitive load, as you uh, brought it up earlier, is really uh, interesting here because we actually have to think perhaps about less things than other gatherers did. And mm -hmm. The, it's arguably the reason that the human brain has shrunk since agriculture was invented. We can focus on a narrow career and go around and get food from the grocery store and so forth and not worry about all these elements of society that are prefabricated for us. So our difficulties in life have been reduced indeed, even though hunter-gatherers actually had very good lives. I will say that they, they had fabulous lives. I wouldn't mind being one, but these kinds of the society is now too complicated for us, and our way of handling it has become specialist. Right. Could you talk a little bit about another item that I've heard you mention before, uh, the, the markers people use to help identify people in their society versus someone who would be foreign to their society? And these markers, I understand, can be quite subtle. Yeah, no, I brought them up briefly one more when we were entering that coffee shop, but they can be quite subtle. There's a, There are studies showing, for example, that if you ask an American to identify someone at a great distance walking towards them and who they are, they can usually correctly say that, that whether they're American or not. They have no, most people have no idea they have this skill, mm -hmm. but there's some subtle way of walking that uh, connects with being an American or how they wave their hand. And uh, so uh, there are many signals like this. This is part of this uh, ensemble that I talked about. Most of the emphasis in, among academics is on language, and that's a pretty obvious one and important because you, know, you can detect whether someone's from another country, certainly, and sometimes even from parts of your own country 
before you even see them around the corner and so forth. But these cues are there, these signals are there in all of us all the time. And they would have been important even for hunter-gatherers. You can imagine how this uh, capacity would evolve. I mean, you're a hunter-gatherer, and in the great distance on the Kalahari, you see another San Bushman walking towards you. Is it a fellow member of your San group or someone else? That could be a life and death choice. If you make the wrong decision, you could get hurt. So these signals became very useful for us, and they cost us almost nothing, as I've said. They're very simple. In aggregate, they're very complicated. There are lots of them, and some of them are complicated indeed. At the other end of the, exp end of the spectrum, you have rituals and uh, religions, some of them crossing societies now, but all kinds of uh, complex things you need to know, you know, national anthems and so forth. But for the most part, you don't need those to pick out who belongs and who doesn't. Mm, right. And so we, we've been in COVID. We're recording this in early August 2021, and we've been experiencing COVID for the last year and a half or so, where people have been wearing masks out and about in society. How do you think the wearing of masks has, has or has not affected some of this social recognition phenomenon and these markers of uh, telling who's who in the zoo? Well, it's interesting. Uh, there are a variety of different uh, ways that societies express themselves, and some are more conformist than others. We are highly individualistic in this country. Conformist societies are taking to these uh, the, the pandemic much better. I mean, wearing a mask makes sense for them. In fact, uh, masks were there before the pandemic came along. You may have uh, seen occasionally uh, Japanese or Chinese tourists, I saw them in Hawaii once wearing masks. And you're going like, why are they wearing masks? This was three, four years ago. And it just was this form of social politeness. It had to do in part with their own concerns about health because pollution and so forth. But it was also just social politeness too. But the other difficulty has been that the pandemic came on very suddenly. If you look back at the history of the things that we've been asked to force to do, and there are some of them out there, we are, we are not free to do everything. We don't, we have to stop at stoplights. Yeah, yeah. Right. Uh, you may feel that's an infringement on your freedom, but if you drive through them, you'll probably hurt yourself and or someone else. And so it's similar to the mask situation, but for things like seat belts, people hated them at first. It take, took years for them to adjust to that. But at this point, we've forgotten that fact. And uh, we've all wearing seatbelts, most are, are all of us. But these masks were forced on us very fast. And a lot of us are rebelling like we first rebelled against uh, seatbelts. And so there, there's the, also the question that you brought up that the mask can become a symbol of a hu what a person believes, who they are. Yeah. And the trick there is we start to see people who don't wear masks if we like them or do wear masks if we don't as almost foreign and uh, this mental transformation may be even easier for masks because people tend to asso associate disease with outsiders if you show there are studies showing that if you uh, show folks images related to disease and then show them pictures of immigrants they are more negative about the immigrants so outsiders are associated with disease, and perhaps in a biological sense, in terms of deep history, it had some meaning because if you had a closed community and someone came in and they were carrying a virus, keeping them out made sense. Now we have medical ways of handling it, of course, but our minds still go back to that disease means outsider connection. Mm, yeah, that is fascinating how our you know, deeply rooted survival instincts, you know, th things that were life and death on the savannah, you know, hundreds of thousands of years ago are still informing our decision making and the way we navigate the world today. Sometimes it might be highly relevant and other times it might be spurious biases, which are uh, still lingering and affecting our societies. Would you say that that's fair? Oh, yeah, all over the place. There are these little things, and many of them have some kernel of sensibility built yeah. into them, at least if you look yeah. into the past. Yeah. But the fact that they are irrelevant or we don't have to be concerned about them anymore or that they're causing a social stress 
with other people when it doesn't need to be there, it just drives you crazy. Yeah, yeah. And uh, there are people who have figured out what these various different bias buttons are and these, these emotionally charged ways of these, these levers of influencing people. People have figured these things out and are exploiting them without a doubt. I'd like to come back to that point we were talking about a few minutes ago. And so I've, I've heard you mention cosmopolitanism in societies. So a couple of times on this podcast, I've asked guests about uh, new models of sovereignty emerging where online communities or even virtual worlds start becoming their own borderless nation states. Does your study of societies have anything to say about these kinds of scenarios? Well, that's true to, to a degree in that uh, these connections between societies can grow much stronger now that we can potentially find a friend in, uh, anywhere in the world now. But that doesn't mean societies are going to go away. When uh, people talk about cosmopolitanism, they usually, they often talk about this gradual reduction in the number of societies over time. Mm -hmm. And that's happened ever since hunter-gatherer days when you had groups of a few hundred or a couple of thousand. Societies have gotten fewer and larger. But the truth is that those increases in size have been driven by war and domination, not by anything like the Facebook or the internet of that day. Societies have conquered each other since chiefdoms uh, arose out of hunter-gatherer societies. And um, we absorb those other cultures and, uh, and take them in as part of ourselves. And in fact, that's true as well across societies. So well, cosmopolitanism as a, in the purest sense of losing the national identity is not going to happen. So, for example, the Chinese have been eating Kentucky Fried Chicken and Coca-Cola and all these things, and it's always thought, well, maybe they're just going to become more like us. But in fact, societies absorb other cultures. They always have. Hunter-gatherers traded with each other, and that didn't reduce their identity. In fact, in the case of the Chinese, they're becoming more Chinese as far as it goes. So you take those things in and you transform them. You mean the Statue of Liberty is French, but we've forgotten that. We take them in and make them part of ourselves. So this is the us and them mentality in a nutshell, creating an identity that's us and having a point of comparison. And that isn't all negative. Uh, because those identities give us a sense of meaning and validation. Mexican-Americans don't want to lose their Mexican heritage, but they still want to be seen as American. And so that's the tricky balance point that these ethnic groups have within societies, but it also reflects how we deal with other societies. And you can see that in terms of alliances between societies, which have occurred throughout the past without the societies buckling under and disappearing. So the Iroquois Indians, six nations, six uh, societies, nations of the Iroquois worked to protect each other. But last, those six societies stayed intact throughout the centuries. And in fact, the reason they existed was to protect against them, the outsider. So having a global society with no point of reference is not going to work for humans. That means that achieving the kind of mutual respect of rights and needs that, uh, that uh, cosmopolitan thinkers want is going to be an onerous, ever-shifting target. I mean, we can do it, but it's not going to be a simple thing. It's going to be an ongoing concern. Hmm. And this is all very relevant to immigration as well. Yes. Well, that's the a question of identity as well. Immigration, immigrants are a relatively modern thing. The Romans let people in, but you didn't find massive numbers of individuals coming into societies, and certainly in hunter-gatherer times. Hunter-gatherers were very uniform societies. So the, the possibility of immigrants in a mass scale being a, a coming of their own volition and staying, and not because of a war, taking them over, but staying uh, yeah. because they're accepted is a relatively new thing. But the trouble is the fact that there are history of introducing these people and forming over time these ethnicities and races was largely aggressive. 
uh, meant that there was a hierarchy. And we at the top, the original owners of that society, or stay at the top. And the expectation we t- has kept that way for immigrants. Immigrants come, and we're comfortable with them coming, socially comfortable, if we expect them to have jobs that are lower in the hierarchy than us, so they're not going to be competing with us or anything. And if there's a hardship out there and jobs are scarce, that's when immigration becomes tricky. Even the Romans, who were very uh, open to outsiders coming into Rome, would expel them in times of famine. Outsiders left. You were forced out. So the trick uh, here is that citizenship as it's legally defined, doesn't correspond to how the brain registers who belongs. But they're not walking like an American yet. They're not talking like an American yet. And that takes some generations. T.H. Marshall, a famous uh, British expert on citizenship, called it a claim to be accepted as a full member of the society. But what do you mean by full? Many people, as they first come in, aren't seen as full members. All these different groups have to integrate in a way that does not cause the power group, the dominant group, some dissatisfaction. This has always been the problem. We have to deal with this in times of stress. And that's been, you know, the situation for a few years now. Wow. Yeah. You said a lot there. And it does seem to comport with with my working knowledge of the world. So immigration, uh, immigrants, on paper, on you know, the, the laws on the books might say one thing, but our human wiring, our evolutionary wiring has a different set of rules <laughs> that we follow, which might not map nicely onto the, the laws. Would you say that exactly. that's about right? Yeah, and the, uh, but the amazing thing is we do let individuals in. And that was true even in distant history. If you live in a small group of hunter-gatherers, there are only a few hundred of you, you're going to get highly inbred unless you can let others in. And those others would be usually a mate coming in from another society. And that person would be expected, as they are today, to take on the language and characteristics of that society as best they could. And uh, that, so we can do that is pretty amazing. And it's opened us to these societies that are full of riches. And they add, those riches adds immensely to the society because they bring in all kinds of skills and so forth that you don't have otherwise. Mm. Social stresses come with those. Mm -hmm. Well, so for the United States, we talk about ourselves proudly as a nation of immigrants. And perhaps we do tend to be much more of a heterogeneous society nation than than other nations. So does the immigration phenomenon, this this, uh, conflict may not be the right word, but this difference in the rules, the, the laws that we have versus the way we innately behave around immigrants and treat immigrants to our nation do because we're a heterogeneous society do we have different immigration dynamics than say some other country that tends to be a lot more homogenous well most U- european countries tend to be pretty ho- homogenous and so you end up with a headscarf rule in france and so forth but again it has to do with uh, the social stresses and the fact is that uh, a greater proportion of blacks have ancestors going deep in the history of this country than whites, because many whites emigrated in the last century. But that does not make them appear equal to, in our in our pr- brain processing to whites. These are studies from psychologists showing that even if you're a progressive mind person, you're likely to associate guns with blacks and so forth. So all these kinds of worries we have that even if we hide them away are there and overcoming them is a matter of training. The fact that they're there is not. The fact that we pick out these groups is not. A three-month-old infant before it learns language already can detect others of the ethnic and racial group 
of their caregiver and respond more positively to those individuals. So this kind of processing is there. These kinds of biases are there. They're the same kind of biases that allow us to make sense of the world generally. It's the same set of bias that allows you to tell when a chair is a chair and a table is a table. We divide up the word world into categories. The trick is, excuse me, the trick is that when we combine those categories with all kinds of other biases about things, and those are learned, of course, over time as we're growing up, but those can become deeply embedded. You can circumvent them, but to do it permanently is, is difficult indeed. And so these are challenging problems and really important problems for psychology, particularly to deal with diversity in a positive sense. Hmm. Yeah, you know, as you were talking about that, especially the mention about uh, infants exhibiting these phenomenon before they can even speak. So what are your thoughts about uh, the, the digital nature of our interactions these days and the online world? And just to, to, to give a very simple example, you can be engaging with somebody online and that person is, does not necessarily have to be the kind of person that they're representing themselves to be. They could say that they're a woman, but they're in fact a man, and you can go on and on and on, right? So our online engagements, short-circuiting or circumventing some of these innate ways that we assess people, and that is could potentially have implications for the way our societies are navigating going forward. Hmm. Well, thank for asking this uh, question that requires a two-hour answer at the end of the near the end of the interview. <laughs> <laughs> and take, you know, take, I'm, take 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 all the time you need. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm just going to speak to it briefly yeah, because yeah, there's yeah. so many ram uh, thing avenues to pursue there, which is fascinating. And you know, maybe we can get a a seminar together and uh, get a bunch of people talking about these things. But, you know, basically... You get what I'm asking, though, right? Yeah, the basic uh, question is, uh, initial, our initial response to the internet was like, this is great. Mm -hmm. And uh, from the point of view of psychology, it looked great because you're you're generating all kinds of cross-cutting ties, they're called, ties between different groups. And that is true for the functioning inside societies as well. You know, you can have a, a black or Asian community and a white community that all want to go to the same ball game and support the same team. And that reduces the sense of difference and stress, even though we're still going to categorize people. And those cross-cutting, cross-cutting ties extending all the way to Mongolia look like a good deal. But in fact, you know, what what has happened is that communities of uh, obscure communities of people with varied interests have managed to find each other that never would before and have created all kinds of groups that aren't interested in cross-cutting ties. They're interested in a particular thing that's sometimes quite dysfunctional. And so that's expressed in so many ways nowadays. I don't particularly want to go into it, but if we could figure out how to focus people on these cross-cutting ties that are positive, internet would be a great vehicle for social change. But at the moment, it's chaos. That's all I'm going to say. Concur with all of that. And uh, with that, Dr. Mark Moffat, who is the author of The Human Swarm, How Our Societies Arise, Thrive, and Fall. Mark Moffat, thank you so much for being on The Cognitive Crucible. John, you've been great. Thank you. The Cognitive Crucible is the only podcast dedicated to increasing interdisciplinary collaboration between information operations practitioners, scholars, and policymakers. To find out more about the Information Professionals Association, visit us at information-professionals.org. Please support our podcast by giving us a five-star rating and leaving a review.